My name is Johnny Nguyen, and uh, over the course of the next few minutes, I want to share with you uh, the last 35 years of my life and what I went through. And I just want to give you a bit of a warning that some stories that I might tell uh, to you might be a bit gruesome. Uh, there may be a bit of blood involved, but the reason why I tell you this is because I want to let you know the extremes that I went to uh, so you can see the difference to who I am today. And that's the reason why I tell some of these stories, and, uh, and I'm going to keep names out of these stories here. This is what I went through. This is what I uh, went through in my life. And so uh, open up your heart. Let's, let's take uh, uh, from the beginning of where everything began. Uh, my family fled the Vietnam War in the late 1970s. And if you know anything about the war, this was a war that killed over 2 million uh, Vietnamese soldiers, American soldiers, and Vietnamese civilians. And uh, what would often happen was the communists would come, would knock on the door, they'll raid your home, they'll take your possessions, your, your car, your, your house, your, the women would get raped. And so this was the environment that my parents grew up in. And so they wanted to flee Vietnam. And so we got about uh, 30 families uh, involved in our family on board and they fled and their destination was Australia. And so on the way by boats, uh, two of my uncles fought overboard. My dad's brothers, they fell overboard. And my grandfather was the skipper of this, this vessel. And so he was circling around his sons, my uncles there, and uh, they were trying to rescue them back. Uh, one, they managed to pull one uh, back onto uh, board, but the other one uh, was lost at sea. And my grandfather being the skipper, he said, you know what, uh, we spent three hours circling these waters here. There's 20 odd other people here. We need to go and get out of here because it's too dangerous. So he left his son to die somewhere in the middle of the, the ocean. And so you can imagine the heartache already as my family set their feet uh, uh, um, here in Australia. And so here I was born 1984. And as you can see in this photo here, uh, my brother is next to me there in, in, in the bow tie. I've got uh, an Asian uh, cousin there to my left and the other white guy I'm not sure who he is exactly and probably a neighbor but the reason why I say that is because we grew up in a, in a very tight-knit home we my parents didn't know how to speak English uh, uh, and so we stuck uh, to our own our, our immediate family we didn't really venture beyond and we were very, quite paranoid growing up uh, in this community because it was so different to what I was used to and so uh, um, I grew up in a very poor family uh, my mother would sew clothes in the back shed uh, and not making much money at all my father uh, was going and learning English as a second language and he would also work shift work making fire extinguishers and so very early memories of mine are, are at home eating dinner around the, the table together very early on. My parents doing the best to make ends meet. Uh, I, I remember enjoying playing basketball. It was so poor, my mother couldn't buy me any basketball shoes. So she would go to Vinnie's, St. Vincent de Paul, buy me some uh, basketball shoes and the air bubbles popped. And so uh, I was wearing these around school trying to make things work. But I remember very distinctly at the age of 12 years old, I remember saying to myself that whatever I'm going to do in life, I'm going to do well because I'd seen the struggle, I'd seen the hurt, I'd seen the pain that caused my family, this poverty, this having nothing in our lives. And I wanted to make something of my life. 12 years old, I had a dream to be a doctor or a lawyer. I remember my parents would... Uh, sometimes drop me off at school and they would drive a white Camry, Toyota Camry, very old school car. The bumper bar was half hanging off and I'll be so embarrassed. I'll say, listen, drop me around the corner of the school. I don't want anyone to see our car. And But they'll drop me in front and the kids would look and laugh. Uh, but this is who we were. We didn't have much and we tried to make things work in our family. And so I was an A grade student all the way up to the age of 16. And here in, in this next video, you see my friends here. Here we are at 16 years of age. And I'm an A-grade student. In the photo there, I look uh, about 30 kilos lighter. I've got some blonde, uh, different sort of hair happening then. Uh, but uh, I'm an A-grade student, wanting to do well, wanting to succeed. But around this time, this is when things begin to change. Around this time was when I uh, began to meet some uh, guys in the school that were, that were part of gangs and had family involved 
in gangs and so i stopped studying later for school 15 16 years old started smoking weed uh popping pills snorting speed and and, and bass and uh partying on the weekends thursday fridays and saturdays and just lit just living that life and I, 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 I experimented with this and I'm thinking, man, this is a life uh, a style that I've missed out for all these years of my life. What am I doing? I remember a story that happened to, my, to me when I was 17 years old. So around this time here, uh, my uncle, who was a branch leader of the biggest Vietnamese gang in Australia called the 5T, he came over to my house and he gave me a pound of marijuana. And he told me, he says, Johnny, put this in your room and I'll come back uh, in a few days and I'll pick it up. And I remember coming home one Thursday night and my father was sitting there in the living room with his pound of marijuana on the table. And I walked in, my father's old school. And so all he has to do is look at me and I know that I'm going to get a hiding. I'm 16, going on to 17 years of age. And he looks at me and he says these words. He says, Mày ngồi xuống đây. Mày muốn buông bán. Mày dọn đồ mày đi đi. Mày muốn ở đây. Mày dẹp hết đồ này. Mày hiểu không? What my dad was saying is, you sit down here right now. You want to sell these drugs, you pack up your stuff and you leave. But if you want to live under my roof, you get rid of these drugs. Do you understand? And I remember 16 years old, I was angry. I was furious. Got on the phone, called my cousin, picked me up. Dad's lost his mind. I packed up two bags and in my 16 year old mind, I said, Dad, you don't even understand why I'm doing this. We're poor as we are broke as a joke. And, and I just wanted to make some money to help you guys out. I want to make some money so we can move out of this uh, uh, fiber home that's broken and cockroaches everywhere. I wanted to do something for you to help you guys out. And I was so angry, frustrated, uh, drinking alcohol, on drugs at the age of 16 years. I walked out of that house. And as I was walking through, my father was still seated there to my right. I looked to my left and I see my mother there. And she's weeping. She's crying. She says, son, don't leave. You're getting up dead like your uncles. You're getting up dead or in jail just like them. I look to my right again. It's out the front door. My cousin pulls up. I remember to turn around, look at my mother for the last time until I, another 10 years down the road till I speak to her again. I turned my back on my family and I left. And these next 10 years of my life was a vicious cycle of gangs, drugs, crime that I could uh, try even to erase out of my mind today. But it's just scarred me in a way that, 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 that I, I truly remember these, these 10 years of my life as a as devastating time for me. You know, at the age of uh, 17, going on to 18, so uh, a year after I, I left home, I get a phone call from my sister. And my sister tells me that my mother has just left with my dad's best friend. They've been having an affair for the last year. And as you can imagine, a 17-year-old going on to 18, I was furious. I was angry and this just added fuel to the, 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 my, my, my heart. This added fuel to my anger and my frustration here. And I remember meeting up with my dad, who's an old school man, after this event. And he was a truck driver by this stage. And he jumped out of his truck and met me at the front of his home. And I heard what had happened and I pointed to my dad. I said, Dad, I'm going to kill this man. I'm going to kill mum. You wait, nobody messes with our family like this. My father being an old school man, never did I see him cry in those 17 years of my existence. But that afternoon, I seen one teardrop fall down his face and he says, son, look after yourself. Just look after yourself, son. I walked off and my mission from then on at the age of 17 was to kill my mum and to kill my mum's new husband who cheated on my dad here for a whole year, his best friend. These two were my targets for the next few years. 
And so it went out of control here. I was uh, going clubbing. Every time would go into a club. Almost every time would end up in a fight. Uh, I would leave the clubs battered, bruised. And it was just a, a, a toxic lifestyle I was living. Some of my influence at the time was uh, I was uh, really good friends with the biggest outlaw motorcycle gang in Australia, the, the boss of this gang. I was friends with him. I was friends with his family. His nephew was best friends of mine uh, growing up. And so I went to their parties. I went to these bikey parties. I went to their, 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 their gatherings. I socialized with them. And I had a relationship with these uh, heavy hitters, so to speak, in a way that was so deep, that runs deep, uh, uh, in my relationship with them. Uh, my, another friend of mine uh, who I was, uh, uh, had a really good relationship with at this time, uh, he's doing 56 years in prison now in Goulburn Supermax Lockup. And uh, what he told me was, uh, he used to give me advice in life. And what, what he would say is, Johnny, make sure in the boot of your car that you have a lighter, you have petrol, and that you have some pliers. So that just in case you get into a fight and you kill that person or a gang member comes against you and, and you kill this guy, that you, you get rid of the evidence. He goes, you make sure that you pluck out their teeth with these pliers, you pour this fuel and petrol on them, and you get the light and you burn them up, get rid of the evidence. And so this is my upbringing in this life of gangs. This is my upbringing in this life of drugs, this criminal lifestyle. I remember now being a poor man, but now at the age of 20 years old, this once poor man could have whatever he wanted. I wanted a house, I bought two houses. I wanted a car, I bought a $200,000 car. I wanted a nice food to eat, I'll go out and spend thousands of dollars out on a Friday night just to enjoy this life that I never had. You see, with this lifestyle, there comes consequences. There are a lot of enemies, people, the enemies, people that were against me, were looking uh, for me, they were out for me. Uh, I remember a time when I was about 22 years of age, I was left for dead on the streets of Sydney. And so what had happened was a friend of mine had been robbed. And so I went to this location here and, and I, I, I spoke to uh, this guy and said, listen, give back the drugs here. And he says, wait a moment. And around the corner of this home comes about 12 bikey looking dudes. And at this location here, there was an altercation. And at the back of the group, I see something shiny and a gunshot goes off at the back of this group. And then before I knew it, I was whacked over the side of my head. I got stabbed in the back of the head, stabbed in the arm, the hand, and on my back. And this went on for a few minutes here. And, and, and the next thing that happened is I remember right before I fell down, to the left side right before I was knocked out unconscious and waking up in the back of an ambulance I remember looking up and right before I was knocked out I looked up and I made eye contact with the friend that called me to come help him and as I was falling down and right before the guy stomped on my face I looked up and made eye contact with him he saw me in this desperate need and this friend of mine turned his back and ran the opposite direction and that was the last thing that I remember before I got knocked out, whacked out. Uh, and uh, uh, moments later, waking up back over the ambulance, waking up in hospital with all these drips coming out of me. There was internal damage, uh, internal bleeding here, uh, stab wounds to the back of my head and all sorts of, all over my body here. I was left for dead there in the streets there of Sydney. And you will think something like this happening to a 22 year old, a young man will cause him to change the course of his life. But for me, I said, I'm going to go even harder. I'm going to go even deeper into this criminal world and I'm going to make a stand for my life. I don't care who's after me. I'm going to go all the way and give my life for this cause. And that's what I did for the next four years of my life. I went harder. I went deeper. Uh, I became one a uh, big drug dealer there in Western Sydney, and at the age of 23, I got sick of the drug dealing scene. Uh, this photo here is when I got arrested in Fairfield for assault, causing grievous bodily harm, intent with a weapon. And as you can see in this photo, I remember looking down at these police lenses. I remember looking down as the police were taking photos of my gang tattoos and, and, and all parts of my body that has gang related tattoos. 
And I remember looking down at the police here as he's taking this photo. And I remember saying to him, I'm going to kill you. Who do you think you are? I want to find you and your family and I'm going to get rid of you. You understand? You got nothing. You're not going to stop me. I remember them take me around the back and we get into a fight with them there and they beat me up a bit there in the cell there. But this was my attitude. I'm staring at this camera. This is such a coldness of who I am. I'm staring at this camera thinking you cannot do anything to me. You can't touch me. I'm going to take you out. And for the next four years of my life, I gave up the drug dealing and I actually became a standover man, an extortionist and a debt collector. Debt collector, somebody owes you money, you call us, we go get it for you, we charge you 10, 15, 20%. Extortionist, we go to a shop, we get into the shop and just because you're in this area, we charge you 2,000, 1,000 and a half a week just to be here. Every Friday we'll come and we'll pick up this money. Standover men, other drug dealers in the area, we'll call you up, you come, you bring the drugs, we rob you and we take you and take these drugs and the money. And this is how I lived my life for the next four years of my life. And as you can imagine, these four years was a time of such uh, 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 out of control life. I, 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 I didn't even know what day it was. I was so high on drugs. These four years of my life, I, I pumped two and a half thousand dollars worth of crystal meth ice into my body every single week. I was literally brain fried. I was literally uh, not the man that I am today, so to speak. I was a different man that was, f uh, that was driven by this drug. I was so paranoid. I used to hallucinate, hear voices, and see things that aren't there in the room. There'll be days when I'll be up uh, weeks for, for three to four days in a week, I'll be up. I wouldn't eat any food. I'll lose five to six kilos and then I'll pump myself up with steroids, go work out and put a few kilos back on. And this was a, a weekly cycle for me. I remember uh, during this time here, um, going to see a friend of mine and this friend of mine here was someone who was straight. He never used to take any drugs and we were on the way to his birthday. And as we approach the, his, his, his hotel for the birthday, I get a phone call from my friend who's there already. And he calls me and he says, listen, Johnny, don't come. Something's happened. And he hangs up the phone. What had happened was my friend who never took drugs, my friend who was straight, this guy who went to university for three years to be a lawyer, what had happened that night was a friend of ours gave him an ecstasy pill to celebrate his birthday. And he took this drug here and after taking the pill, he runs and stands on the balcony. And he puts his hands up in the air and says, I can't take this life anymore. I can't take it anymore. He puts one leg over the balcony and drops down 20 odd stories there from a hotel in the city. A good friend of mine runs to the edge, looks down and a friend of ours is there in a pool of his own blood. He takes his own life. At 21 years old. You see, this did something to me. This made me contemplate my life and what I was doing. You know, it made me stay up at night even more considering my life. What has what my life come to? And there'll be pockets and moments of my life and I'll consider what is the point of my life? Is this why I'm on this earth to live to run amok like I'm doing, to kidnap people, make a living like this of drugs, alcohol, rock and roll, so to speak, and then die? Is this my life? June 16, 2010, this is when things begin to change. Just to give you a brief background of around this time, the police were after me. Uh, I was looking at 12 years prison. The reason why I know this is because I was friends with a, 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 a barrister and used to be a prosecutor for the police. I paid him a, a decent amount of money to find this information. And the police were looking for me. I was looking at 12 years prison. And so I was on a run from the police. I was going from one location to the other. I was paranoid. I'm still on drugs. And I pull up into this service station here in Chester Hill. And I pull up into this server, I'm filling up petrol and right behind the counter was a Lebanese guy, shaved head, tattoo, six foot tall. He was kind of a bikey looking dude and he's looking out of this service station there. 
and I'm filling up petrol and I'm looking around. Remember, I'm, I'm on the run, man. I'm, there's a warrant out for my, my arrest. They've come to two of my family's home looking for me. And I fill up petrol and as I leave to go and pay for it, I walk into the servo and I catch eyes with this man. And I'm approaching this, the, the counter and he looks down and he puts his hand out and says, Hey, how are you, bro? I remember looking at this guy thinking, man, you're either trying to set me up and kill me. You got boys in the back. Or you've got a liking to men. You might be homosexual. I'm not sure which one it is. This is what was going through my mind. And he said to me, he says, hey, listen, can I ask you a question before you go? I said, yes. He goes, do you know God? And in that moment, I looked at this guy and I said, are you serious, bro? Do I know God? Don't, don't ask, don't question me about my religion and my faith. Look at you, bro. You're a tat's ever. You're just as worse than me. Don't call yourself a religious person. And he goes, no, 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 please understand. He goes, listen, I'm a born again Christian. Jesus Christ died and rose from the dead and began to tell me about the gospel. And he gave me his number and a fly. He said, listen, come out to this event tonight. There's a man that's going to share his story of how Jesus transformed his life. I took that flyer, I left, and that night, June 16, 2010, with my girlfriend at the time, I stepped into a local uh, congregation in Maryland. I went to that church, and this is when things begin to change. So I walk into this church building, and it wasn't anything like I expected it to be. I came from a Catholic background. I went to church for 17 years of my life every Sunday. And that night I walked into this church and there was no statues. There was no Jesus on a cross. There was no stained glass windows. It was just an office room with about 20 chairs there. And I'm thinking, man, this guy set me up for real. He set me up here. He is a bikey. He's going to take me out right here and now tonight. And what is this place? And so uh, that night there, there was an ex-Australian soldier uh, by the name of Mark Woods. And he began to tell his story about growing up as a soldier and as a, uh, uh, as a really violent man. And how he nearly killed seven guys in a uh, pub fight that caused him to spend time behind bars. But then he spoke about a time when he come face to face with himself and his life. And somebody shared the gospel of Jesus Christ to him. And that night of the service, he began to preach Jesus Christ. He began to talk about Christ, how Christ died on the cross. And, and when he said that, I, I, it resonated with me. I understood because I remember seeing Jesus on a cross every Sunday at my other church. At the Catholic church, I seen Jesus on a cross with the crown of thorns, the nail through his hands and feet. I seen that and I knew that. But then that night, Mark Woods goes on and says that not only did Jesus die, but three days later, he rose from the dead and he's alive. And in him rising from the dead, he can change your life and set you free. And that was the first time in the 27 years of my existence did I ever hear the full gospel of Jesus Christ and hear that Jesus can change someone's life. I never heard of it. I thought it was just something we did every Sunday. Go be religious, say some prayers, walk out and just get on with your life. And at the end of that service, he gave an invitation. He said, if you're out here tonight and if that's you and you want to repent and turn from your sin and put your faith in Jesus, you will lift up your hand. You come out the front. That night I lifted my hand. I came out the front and a brother from the church put his arm around me. And I bowed my knee and I said, Lord... I've messed up my life. I'm a sinner. But I don't want to go that way anymore. God, if you can change my life, I believe Jesus died for me on the cross and rose for me. I repent. I don't want to go that way. I choose to follow you. God, if you can do anything with my life, here I am. Help me to live for you. In June 16, 2010, I got up from that service never to be the same man again. God did an absolute miracle in my life. And that night I was born again, never to be the same person. The next day I remember, remember I had a $2,000 drug habit. On the run from the police, the next day 
I wake up and my normal custom would be go get the ice, go get the pipe or the foil, put the ice on it, burn it, chase the dragon or blaze the pipe. But June 17, the next day I woke up and I didn't feel like this anymore. I didn't want to do this anymore. And I remember feeling really weird and thinking, what's going on? I remember getting my phone and calling uh, the pastor of that church who I spoke with that night. And I say, hey, listen, what's going on, man? Uh, what, can you tell me what happened to me? How come I don't feel like this drug anymore? It's been, I've been doing it for four years straight, but how come I don't feel like this anymore? And he says, you know what, Johnny? God did an absolute miracle in your life, and he set you free last night because of what Jesus Christ has done. I'm like, what? Are you serious? And listen, moment after moment event after event i'm telling you, god has continually over the last 10 years done miracle after miracle god has set me free and, and now i realize what a joy it is to know that you are right with the heavenly maker with god who created you i know what it is to be right with god the 27 years of my life that i've been alive at from that moment i've been searching for purpose i've been searching for love that I didn't find from my father. I've been searching for friends that would stick by me and go all the way with me and yet I was left for dead at the age of 22. I was looking for a reason to be alive. I remember back to moments of lying on my bed thinking, is this all that life has to offer me? Is this my life? I'm going to die like this. Are you serious? Is this why I've been created? And that moment on, I realized that God had a purpose, God had a plan. And it revolutionized my life. And here, down the road here, numbers of things that have taken place ever since then. I begin to work a full-time job. You might be watching there, you say, ah, what's that? Everyone works. Not everyone. Listen, man, I, I hadn't worked in my life. The only jobs that I had were six months at Macca's and six months at Woolies when I was 17 years old. That was the only time I worked. But now to be able to work a full-time job, five days a week, pay taxes instead of taxing people man that's an absolute miracle for me my mind god delivered me from paranoia schizophrenia uh, I, I, I used to hear voices and see things literally I, I used to laugh to myself i was sitting in a room and i used to hear this voice and begin to laugh and others there in the room were looking at me thinking you're weird what's wrong with you man you're fried from these drugs I used to see things there and as I'm driving, I used to see things that weren't even there. But God set me free from the paranoia and, 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 and the hallucinations and the voices in my head. God did a miracle in my mind. Some other things that have happened is now he's surrounded me with some wonderful friends that I, I thought I had. But really, until I met these guys that follow Jesus, other Christians... Man, it totally changed the definition of friendship. You know, these guys that are close to me now, that are Christians, man, I can give them the key to my home, the key to my car, and trust these guys with my life. God has given me friends that I've been looking for my whole life. Some other things that have happened uh, since then is now I'm married. Now, this is an absolute miracle. I'm married to a beautiful blonde Australian girl who's about six foot tall. I don't know if you can see in the video, but I'm quite a short guy, man. I'm Vietnamese here, short, stocky guy. And my wife is six foot tall, beautiful, white, blonde Australian. And I've been married to this same lady now for the last eight years. You know my understanding of what a marriage and a family was just 11 years ago? My understanding of a family was, this is what I wanted. I wanted 10 different children with 10 different ladies in 10 different parts of the world. That was my understanding of what a family is. I had no reference point. My family broke up. My, I wasn't raised up in a loving family. I didn't know what it was to have parents that loved and cared for you and would give everything. I didn't know what it was to be in this loving relationship. But now I've been married here for eight years. We have three beautiful children. And my wife's pregnant now as I'm speaking. It's an absolute miracle, the work of restoration that God has done in my life. On top of that, I now pastor a church in Maryland. 
Me, pastoring a church, giving out counsel and advice and preaching the gospel. Man, this is an absolute miracle that God would take somebody like me so broken, so messed up because of sin and turn that life around and use it for his glory. I want to close and finish with this story. Everywhere I travel and talk, I've had the privilege now of traveling to all parts of the world. I've been to Fiji, been to Vietnam, South Africa, all around Australia, New Zealand, to share my story and to preach the gospel. And everywhere I go, I share this story at least one time, just to bring perspective to, to, to life. You see, this man in the photo here, he didn't live a life like me. As a matter of fact, he lived quite opposite to the way I lived. I was a drug dealer, I was a menace to society, I was on drugs, I was drinking. This man was a loving man. This man was a carpenter by trade. This man didn't get on the drugs and alcohol like myself. This man was a good citizen. And, uh, you know, in 2011, I get a phone call and I've been a Christian now for a year. I get a phone call and on the other side of the line was my sister and she's weeping and she's crying and she's, she couldn't even express herself properly. And she's on the phone and she says, Johnny, Johnny, he's killed himself, he's killed himself, come quick, he's killed himself. And I find out that uh, Stephen, this gentleman in the photo, took his life. And... When I heard this over the phone, I fell down on my knees and I, it was like a sick feeling in my gut. It was like someone just literally punched me in my stomach. I couldn't breathe. I was hyperventilating because Stephen was so close to me and now he's taken his life. He's killed himself. I go to the location and, and, and his body is there and whatnot. The reason why this affected me so much the reason why this uh, caused me to react the way I reacted is that because Stephen was my brother. Stephen was the one that you saw in the photo right at the beginning when we were little boys there uh, celebrating my birthday. Stephen was that, the one next to me on the right that you saw there with the bow tie on. Stephen was my brother who was there for me at school. He was five years older than me and so he would walk me to school. He would come and see me at lunch and give me food and he would uh, uh, show me what it is to play cricket and, and rugby league. And he was so close to me and even in my 20s, even in my drug dealing days, he loved me. He would often say to me, Johnny, don't go down this road. You're going to kill yourself. Uh, come follow me. I'll take you on as, a, as a, an apprentice in, in, as, in, and do this trade. And it was trying to pull me out of this life. And when I heard that he killed himself, it devastated me. What had happened was Stephen had a bit of financial difficulties. And around this time here, he, he was uh, depressed. And he went and checked himself into a hospital. They gave him medication. And a week after, he went into his garden shed where he spent hours upon hours making customized fish tank cabinets he was masterful with what he created came to that junction point in his life put a rope around his neck and hung himself in the garden shed the reason why i share this story with you is maybe you can't relate to my life maybe you can't say that you were a drug dealer maybe you can't say that you uh, used to hurt people for a living and kidnap people but maybe you can relate to Stephen's story. A good citizen. A man who worked a normal job. A hard-working man. Someone who loved his family, loved his brother. Someone who looked out for other people. Listen, there came a moment in Stephen's life when he needed more than just himself. He needed a savior. He needed saving. Nine days before he killed himself, I actually went to visit him. And I was a Christian then for a year and God put it upon my heart to visit Stephen. It was a Wednesday night. I went to see him and I said, listen, bro, you know, Jesus Christ is real. And his response to me was, yeah, yeah, I know God is real because what he's done in your life. It's an absolute miracle, bro. But listen, not for me right now. I'm busy right now. It's not for me. Uh, this is not 
for me right now. That, that stuff's not for me, all right? Maybe later on in my life. Nine days later, he kills himself. So as I close this testimony tonight, what about you? What about your life? Maybe right now you're considering your life and where you are situated right now. Maybe these times of restriction or COVID-19 has brought life to an absolute standstill and a reality to you. Now, what is the purpose of my life? What is the reason why I've been created? You see, for me, my whole uh, understanding of life from growing up was to make money, get as much as I can, buy a big house, get married, have all these kids, one day die, and that's about it. That's as far as my life plans went. For Stephen, he had similar plans. He had plans to have a family. He had plans to, to expand his business. He had plans to no doubt uh, adventure the world and do so much with his life. But there comes a moment in every person's life where I believe God gives us an opportunity to respond to his call of salvation. For me, it was June 16, 2010. For Stephen, it was nine days before he took his life. The Bible says that each and every one of us are sinners. I knew this. I, I, I didn't need a preacher to tell me this. I knew that I was a sinner. I knew that the way I lived my life, I was going to go to hell. The Bible says every one of us are along this road. Every one of us by default are sinners. And this sin causes a separation between us and God in this life and ultimately in a place called hell. But God in His goodness and His mercy stepped out of heaven. The only time God ever became a man, Jesus Christ, He went to the cross and He paid the fine. He paid the price on that cross for you and I. He was buried and three days later rose from the dead. Jesus Christ is alive. The Bible says if you are to repent, confess with your mouth, and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, you can be saved. What about you tonight? Do you have assurance that if you're to stand before God, that you'll make heaven your home? If not, I'm going to give you that opportunity that I received 10 years ago. This invitation to repent and know Christ and have everlasting life. Is that you tonight? Is that you today? Is God drawing you to that place to repent and to know Him? And if that's you, I want to pray with you and lead you in a prayer. And I would encourage you, if, 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 if this is you, that you'll pray like you've never prayed before and you'll mean this with everything that you have. And I'm believing God to transform your life from this moment forward. Why don't we pray? I want you to pray with me tonight and say, Jesus, I come to you today as a sinner but I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose from the dead to set me free I repent and turn from my sin and put my life my faith and everything that I am in your hands help me to live for you from this day forward as I surrender everything to you. Help me and be my Lord and Savior from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Really do appreciate you logging on and being involved here. Listen, Jesus Christ can transform anybody's life. And I'm a testimony of that. And it's been 10 years now since I've been serving Christ. And this is the best 10 years that I've ever lived in my life. We serve a wonderful God. And listen, give your life to Jesus Christ. Who knows what God has planned for your life. Appreciate your time. Appreciate Pastor Malcolm and the invitation to come. God bless.